I'm Tim Ventura from AmericanAntiGravity.com, and I'm speaking today with Larry Maurer, the CEO of Unitel Aerospace and a longtime space activist. Well, Larry, thanks for joining us. How yeah, are things going on the Unitel front? Well, it's uh, it's been a long haul. We're still plugging away. Uh, what we've got to offer is uh, the better mousetrap as far as the electric trains, uh, the high-speed maglev, uh, We've kind of uh, shifted our attention to uh, dealing with the uh, greenhouse uh, CO2 effect uh, on the planet causing uh, higher temperatures, which uh, we've got uh, higher temperatures on the planet than uh, we've received in the last 400 years. In fact, uh, there's been a lot of pressure on uh, the federal government to try to do something about it. And uh, uh, like uh, Virgin Galactic uh, uh, had a tape that they... uh, we're talking about their electric tilt train, and they say that that is uh, an answer to uh, solving uh, some of the pollution caused by uh, the massive cars. So more and more people are riding the uh, the uh, tilt train there in, in uh, the UK. There's 12 states uh, putting the pressure on uh, the federal government to try to do something about this pollution, and uh, we think that uh, the electric trains uh, are uh, an answer that is a solution to. Uh, you know, uh, providing uh, mass transportation to the public as an alternative to, uh, you know, the CO2 producing uh, uh, gas engines. Oh, sure, sure. Well, it looks like the it looks like the maglev concept that you're promoting. It rides mm-hmm. in kind of a hemispherical track, right? It almost looks like correct. A, yes. Yeah, it's like a yes. chute that it travels down. Yeah, it's a little bit different than the regular tracks that the standard maglev travels on. It, it uses the haulback magnet array. Uh, with the side support and uh, the bottom uh, repelling magnets that support uh, the, the train. Uh, it's still the same concept. Uh, what it does, it uh, basically fits the exterior of the, you know, it's a cigar-shaped uh, vehicle, which has uh, got a charge on the hull. And uh, so it uh, basically, uh, all it needs uh, is, you know, in other words, our, our ship cannot touch uh, the ground. It has to ride on a magnetic field uh, because of the exterior charge on the hull. So, therefore, it cannot touch any solid surface. So, yeah. that's part of the reason why, you know, we, we need the, the you know, tracks that, that have to match the uh, shape of the exterior of the ship. So, oh, sure, sure. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of the same. It's just a little bit different, but it, it's basically the same haulback array that... Uh, uh, you know, I've explained in in our uh, uh, written interview, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that I saw first thing that, that came to mind, I guess, when I saw the the cigar shaped uh, model that you've constructed. I mean, you have an mm-hmm. amazing model for this thing. The photos are right. Are... That's that's from the cap cone technology, which is the basic shape of a uh, particle, or under extreme magnetic uh, fields, uh, produces a cigar shape. Uh, in other words, uh, you can construct larger vehicles with payloads using the cap cone shape, uh, just stretching it uh, between the apex of the ascending part of the curve or the cap on the cone and stretching it uh, so that it basically produces the same uh, effect where the, uh, the uh, uh, spin-off adherence uh, field uh, kind of uh, you know, sticks to the, the, the uh, hole like, a, like glue, if you will, and the excess of energy is burned off at the tail uh, to pre- uh, prevent uh, cavitation, which is kind of like uh, uh, charged surfaces, uh, kind of like uh, boiling water in a coffee pot. If you don't take care of the cavitation, the, the boiling effect will deteriorate the metal. So therefore, uh, now uh, Arnold Lindbergh, uh, one of our earlier associates, uh, he was uh, in charge of uh, the moonshot, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, with Hughes uh, aircraft back in the early 60s. Oh, okay. Has uh, He's responsible for that particular design to, you know, eliminate the cavitation. Well, now, in this case, cavitation, you're talking about time-space cavitation, right? Yeah, well, it's the electric charge uh, on the surface of the niobium uh, tin metal. Oh, oh, okay. Okay, I see what you're yeah, saying. So, so it the... doesn't deteriorate the, the metal surface. Otherwise, uh, you might get into an explosive... Uh, deteriorating condition, kind of like uh, one of the uh, tiles coming off the space shuttle or whatever. Yeah, so no, the, 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 cap, the cap cone. Um, mm-hmm. So that's also the design for the Unitel Starship, to some degree. Yes, uh, the, the drone, and uh, yeah, it's uh, basically uh, 
the maglev design, we have to feather the uh, signal so that it it won't go. You know, there's I mean, you can go up to 99% of light speed, and there's really no need to to go that fast with a mass transportation. I think 500 miles an hour or so would be sufficient to get from uh, you know London to Paris. I mean, we can go faster than that if we wanted to, but. Uh, yeah, you know, there's yeah. really no need to go extremely fast. You know, well, you know, one of the things that your traditional maglev technology has is mm -hmm. it has little riders that prevent it from going off the track, or if you know right. if the magnets get too high, it'll bounce it up from the bottom and keep it yes. centered. Yes. Now, and it, that's why we have the side, uh, you know, close to the top of that uh, hemispherical track. Mm. Now, as the so track kind of, turns, is that going to cause any trouble? I mean, or do you just make sure that the track is built for very wide turns? It's 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 built for very wide turns so that it can you know uh, land and then uh, turn around and then take off again uh, if you will. Oh, okay. Uh, so also, uh, we we've got a design. Uh, David Henriksen uh, has a design for side jumping tracks so that we can have several landing that can jump you know sideways so they can go nose to tail and then load and then take off one at a time. Uh, of course, when we uh, land or you know pick up. Uh, Passengers or cargo, we have to turn off the uh, the front laser beam and turn the, the exterior charge way down to where it's just basically floating on the, the uh, tracks, so that there's no uh, harm. Uh, you know, nobody's going to get fried by the exterior charge. There's a you know, very intense uh, uh, electric charge on the, the surface uh, that we can produce. That we have to produce to uh, make the uh, vehicle work. Yeah, yeah. Well, in terms of cost to build, how much do you think this would cost compared to your traditional maglev? Well, uh, it's probably going to be about the same thing, <clears throat> same price, uh, you know, just starting from scratch. Uh, you know, of course, when you build your first one, then, you know, you're going to start mass producing them. And then once they get into service, uh, then that's when the price, you know, goes down and it, it becomes well worth it. Um, basically, we'll have to electro polish uh, the surface each time uh, the ship is used, and and to uh, make sure that they're very conductive and clean and all that stuff. And uh, uh, but basically, uh, yeah, about the same uh, cost as a standard maglev uh, type of a uh, uh, train. Yeah, well, and even something like the polishing, maybe there's a way to get that automated. You know. Well, yeah, w one thing that's going to be a lot cheaper is that we don't have to build, uh, you know, a, a 1,200-mile-long maglev track, you know, the, the, the type of a track that you're talking about with the haulback array and all that stuff. All we need the tracks for are for landing and, and taking off. Yeah, well, you know, I, I should actually switch topics and ask you a little bit about okay. the community activism stuff. Now, Tesla Tech right. is coming up, and I'm wondering, are, are you planning on attending this year? Uh, yes, uh, we're going to try to attend every, you know, community event that comes around, especially, you know, whatever is, uh, you know, related to uh, uh, dealing with this pollution or aerospace or electric trains or new technology. Any chance that we've got to get in there and sell our books and, and do our lecture, uh, we're finishing up our PowerPoint display. Uh, Michael Miller will be available. Uh, he's you know, he suffers with hay fever and allergies up till about the middle of July, so we're kind of uh, putting everything off till then. But after then, uh, we're open for anything and everything if we have to travel to uh, MIT or down to, you know, uh, California, wherever we can uh, be invited to. Yeah, well, collector, uh, you guys really get out there and do the networking, you know. Even Gary Voss, oh, yeah. brought, he brought That's Unitel right. materials with him uh, to the STAFE conference this last year. Oh, yeah. I, I was kind of surprised, actually. Gary, you know, he had some prior appointments, so he wasn't mm -hmm. able to be there, unfortunately, until almost the end of the conference. But when he wheeled in the door, there he was with his Unitel materials. And mm -hmm. I thought, you know, it's it's weird. It's <laughs> the kind of scope that you guys have in terms of networking. But, you know, well, but, we've got a, a lot of, you know, diehard people that have been helping us, and uh, we want to just reach out and uh, and tell the public, like, hey, we've got the solution to this, you know, uh, greenhouse effect pollution that's very, very serious. Uh, now, I watched uh, uh, Al Gore on uh, Jay Leno the other night, I think it was last week, and he has a book out, and he's also got a movie out, and he's very, very vehement on how serious this, this problem is. And like I say, there's 12 states uh, you know, trying to put pressure on the federal government to do something about it. And the federal government is, you know, like Bush was saying, uh, oh, well, it's up to the private industry to try to develop uh, hydrogen 
you know, uh, energy and this and that. They're not going to do that. They have to have someone come in and say, do this or else, you know, and that's what we're saying. Now, uh, Virgin Galactic uh, really opened my eyes. Uh, somebody had some a DVD that they put out, and they talked for about, oh, I would say an hour on the fact that they, you know, instilled the uh, uh, electric tilt train there in England. They had a tough time uh, convincing people that uh, it was well worth uh, installing the train and it does 145 miles an hour, which is probably okay for the little island of the UK there, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a solution, and we need to have more. Now ours is better. I mean, we've got we've got to compete with the airlines, and uh, the contrails that are being produced is just really adding to this greenhouse effect. And uh, I, I just can't go on and on and on about it, how serious this is, and that's why we've switched from focusing on aerospace uh you know um research of uh, uh exploration and that sort of thing well you dealing know with this planetary uh, uh problem here th- this is really the best time to start switching to trains too when you oh, think yeah. about it i mean it is not only not only in terms of pollution but the other part is as, as someone who i don't fly that often and so maybe i notice mm-hmm. it a little bit more as you know the the changes pile up when i'm not there but you know, right. I'll tell you, last time I went to the airport, I had to go through a lot of security, and it was pretty slow, and something like a train, maybe they wouldn't have that much, and so I'm, I'm wondering right. if, you know, maybe to the to the average Joe, you know, if you can get a train that goes fast enough to be competitive mm-hmm. with an aircraft, the time they save not having to go through the massive airport security could be mm-hmm. time that they'll get there, you know, faster with the train. Right. You, you board and then you have a, another train coming in every five minutes and one taking off every five minutes. You can see how fast things are going to be moving. And they can move people through the lines quick. They can do the sweep on them, check their luggage and put them on board. Uh, you know, of course, there's going to be, you know, the problem with terrorists and this and that. But, you know, they can go through that process and just get it done in just a couple minutes. Well, know, what, what about have... something like, you know, another... another uh... You know, they use aircraft for stuff like delivering packages and stuff also, right? Mm-hmm. They, all they oh, yeah. fly on those is cargo. What do you think? Right. Uh, you think the train would do pretty well for that application? Maybe even on I hand. think so. You know, I was sitting there watching uh, these trains go by. Uh, like my father was with Southern Pacific for 42 years, and uh, I've been part of the railroad industry my entire life. Uh, I'd go down and watch them, you know, run the hump, you know, and, and hook up all the trains and everything. And I was thinking... Uh, well, gee, you know, I wonder, uh, we can't uh, haul, you know, as, as much, um, you know, like lumber and, you know, just massive amounts of uh, stuff, but we can certainly get things there quicker uh, in fairly large amounts. But uh, I don't, it's going to be hard to compete with, you know, the massive uh, super long trains hauling logs and lumber and, and oil and chemicals and all that stuff, uh, you know, but I think uh, packages, uh you know, stuff that needs to get uh, someplace real fast, um, I think, is important. And uh, and other than that, I think that they need to put, uh, you know, the uh, pollution devices on the diesel motors to, you know, cut down on the exhaust, uh, whatever it takes to uh, cut down this pollution. Yeah, uh, but, yeah. Yeah, we, we can compete with the trains, but it's going to be to a point where it's, it's going to be like with the mail or packages, um, you know, uh, medical supplies, things like that, but not not lumber and logs, and you know, uh, that would just be a bit too much. But it's possible. Oh, sure. You never sure. know. Well, you know, and and at the top speed, you know, at 500 miles an hour, I mean, you're mm-hmm. competitive with an aircraft there. And oh yeah, so... exactly. We have to be. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you know, it's just not. People are just going to get there quicker while on the jet airplane, <clears throat> and so that's why we have to. Uh, compete with them yeah well and so if you can out compete them in terms of waiting through security checkpoints and all that stuff then heck you're mm-hmm. set you know i yeah. i would definitely take the train if we could get me there half an hour faster and for mm-hmm. for going you know for something like san francisco right two and a half hour flight you know and i'm waiting in the airport right. for two hours beforehand and it takes 30 minutes to get out afterwards well yeah then... now think about it it isn't going to cost anything with fuel but it will you know be you know fairly kind of expensive with the maintenance uh, the electro polishing and um, you know the checking of the equipment and that sort of thing, but uh, you know that needs to be done on a standard uh, aircraft. Uh, but we don't have to worry about the fuel and the explosive part of that, and uh, we don't have to fly you know 10,000 feet up in the air. We can fly you know three quarters of an inch off the ground if we wanted to, you know. But uh, 
for safety reasons, will probably be, you know, 10, 15 feet uh, up in the air. Mm, okay. So now, I, I guess the other train. part, in, in terms of the energy that this thing draws, right, because your standard mm -hmm. maglev train, you're going 145-ish around there, right, with maglev. But, mm -hmm. Right. But your maglev train is using an enormous amount of electricity for those magnets, isn't it? Oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, and that's, it's going to take uh, some you know, uh, a pretty good power plant, but uh, when you think about it, uh, the the, uh, the uh, uh, power plant that's, uh, you know, the the, uh, the the dynamos that are powered by the diesel motor on a standard train, now they can put out a lot of electricity. Now, if, if, even if we had to instill that, there's plenty of room to put in, you know, a standard, you know, uh, dynamo type you know, uh, system to create this energy to uh, put the uh, the charge on the hole and power. It doesn't take that much to power the magnetron or the radar, uh, you know, laser lens and all that stuff. But uh, it will take uh, a bit of electricity to uh, keep that charge going on the hole. So, oh, I see. I, I don't think yeah. it's going to be that big of a problem. Yeah, no, it's an excellent point, though. Again, you could put the energy on board the train instead of mm -hmm. putting it on a maglev track. So. Yeah, and, and when you think about it now, they're, they're pretty powerful dynamos. They put out a lot of electricity, and they're, they're powered by the diesel motors. So uh, we don't necessarily have to do that, uh, <clears throat> but uh, we can, uh, you know, put out a, a tremendous amount of uh, charge. Uh, there's, you know, it's not an impossible thing. In other words, it's a very probable. In fact, we've got some associates that are ready to uh, bring in a, their design. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so. Yeah, that's uh, all part of it. <clears throat> well, you know, I, I should ask about, you, um, you know, we'd spoken last year briefly about perhaps you'd wanted to put on a conference in this area, and I, I should right. ask about mm. conference plans and stuff. Right. Uh, we're looking at uh, Portland State University, uh, <clears throat> the physics department, to invite them down for a debate and uh, have a little kind of a lecture just to kind of get started, and then hopefully uh, we can get... Uh, you know, a lot of interest and uh, get a reputation and get uh, invites uh, from uh, various uh, other entities uh, around the, the country and, uh, you know, just kind of uh, get more and more notoriety and get uh, the public familiarized so that they can put pressure on the government to assist us in building our prototypes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know as well as I do, it's going to take more than, you know, $50 million or so to build a complete full-size prototype and all that, but... You know, think about the cost of a standard jet aircraft, you know, and they're making money all the time. And once we build them, we're going to be making money right away because people are going to want to ride on it. That's a good point. It seems like everything costs more these days. You know, they keep trying to pass these levies here in Seattle for stuff. And you'd be amazed mm -hmm. at what just a simple road repair costs. So Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, I just sent uh, the Gates uh, Foundation a little letter up kind of uh, addressing uh, the uh, not only our uh, dealings with the uh, pollution and all that stuff, but our medical uh, frequency targeting uh, system uh, that uh, we, uh, oh, it's been about uh, 12 years. Uh, we met with uh, Fred Hudson Institute of Cancer Research, and they were very vehement about uh, encouraging us to uh, continue on with our uh, research, uh, especially in the areas of inoperable cancer like brain tumors and that sort of thing that are inoperable. So uh, we feel that our system would work uh, using the nuclear magnetic resonance uh, frequency targeting of the uh, pathogens. And uh, so we've got a pretty good idea. We need to develop that. Uh, um, and we just need money. And, and uh, you know, we've got so many things going on and no money. It's ridiculous. But uh, one of these days we're going to build something that uh, is going to get us going to where we're going to, you know, get all of our projects uh, underway. And, you know, the, uh, the financing aspect of it seems pervasive mm -hmm. across the industry. I, right. You know, and, and the strange thing was, you know, I, I went to the STAVE conference a few months ago, and I got mm -hmm. to meet with a lot of large mainstream behemoth-type organizations, a lot of representatives mm -hmm. from those, and, you know, and NASA as well, a lot of people there from NASA. And mm -hmm. the thing that surprised me was, before I showed up, I always figured, well, breakthrough propulsion, anti-gravity, things like this just don't get funding as easily, and that's, you know, that's right. Why. But, you know, yeah. the, the thing that stunned me was those guys don't have funding either. No, they don't. They've been, uh, just like the Air Force, uh, the Air Force is very, very interested in us. And they've been, every year they get less and less money for new, you know, BPP, breakthrough propulsion uh, uh, ideas and uh, inventions. And, and uh, 
So that's the problem. This is why we need to really get the message out to the public to put pressure on the government to, to do something about this, uh, to build prototypes, to build the uh, new devices that, uh, you know, that a lot of the, uh, like you were saying, a lot of these uh, powers that be do not understand the quantum physics or the new the new technology, so they 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 fail to do anything about funding or, or getting behind uh, building prototypes and testing and that sort of thing. Well, you know, I think that's one of the reasons that stuff like conferences are so valuable. It lets people oh, yeah. meet and exchange ideas, but it also that's lets right. us, you know, as as a community. I, I hate to mm -hmm. say this because we have so many wonderful ideas out there, but I think as a community, we need to be able to push at least a few ideas forward, you know, in a mm -hmm. unified manner. And and then as those progress, as they begin to show results, then we'll have funding mm -hmm. for the rest of the projects as the mainstream finance community gets interested. Yeah, this is true. Uh, you know, the times are kind of tough right now, and, and the private industries have really tightened their belts. I know we met with uh, Boeing Aerospace. Uh, it used to be Boeing Aerospace and Electronics. Uh, the president was Charlie Johnson, and uh, we signed the corporate papers, went up and had a technical meeting with uh, their propulsion engineer, Chip Messerol, and uh, their uh, uh, head of uh, advanced technologies, or no, advanced concepts, uh, Dr. Uh, Terrence W. Barrett. Mm, okay. And uh, Barrett uh, said he gave us an A+, plus and uh, suggested that he was going to uh, fund us, and so on and so forth. And then suddenly they changed, they, they changed their name from Boeing Aerospace and Electronics to Boeing Aerospace and Defense Products, moved Charlie Johnson out of the presidency, got a new president in there and didn't want to have anything to do with electronics. Uh, Dr. Barrett resigned uh, and started BSIE in Virginia, uh, Vienna, Virginia, and he's still with us to, to date, and he's ready to uh, build the uh, laser uh, activation equipment. Oh, okay. Electronics. Okay. So, yeah, he's there. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, him and David Froning uh, uh, have a company called uh, Flight Unlimited, and they're ready to, uh, you know, sign a contract with us. Yeah, yeah. Interesting that he moved to the D.C. area. Was that, was that politically motivated? Was he trying to get the better, you know, the big defense contract type stuff? Or um, I think so, yeah. It's a lot of, he's, uh, he was ahead of the B-1 bomber project, and uh, basically, uh, well, I shouldn't really be talking about it, but uh, he told me that uh, he just kind of uh, got tired of uh, the way things were running and uh, just decided, uh, since they got out of electronics and everything, uh, just to pull out and start his own company, and uh, I know that he does a lot of business with the defense contractors, you know, as well as I do. Vienna, Virginia has a lot of them there, so yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I I don't ask him about his business, but he's ready to, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a couple of Art Bell ladies fans. <laughs> These ladies are waving at me. They only knew who I was talking to. Well, anyway. Uh, uh, yeah, Dr. Barrett is uh, ready and waiting as soon as we get the funding. And uh, same way with our computer uh, at uh, UIC, they're waiting, uh, you know, to for us to come over there and pay him to build our first uh, uh, prototype. Where uh, Professor uh, Ted Williams will be uh, coming over to uh, tune the lens to uh, react to his operating system and so on and so forth. So we'd have the world's first PC-sized quantum computer which uh, the Israelis in 2000 uh, built a quantum computer and they cracked the uh, World War II Bletchley Park code in 12 milliseconds, which would take a standard computer or a chip uh, computer 100 years to uh, crack. And uh, that information was quelled uh, <clears throat> by the DOD because they thought it would cause uh, uh, panic and uh, this and that uh, where we think there's a lot of uh, corruption going on with uh, their contractors and this and that. Well, you know, now now that you're mentioning IT technologies, I've been asking mm -hmm. around, you know, as, as our audience, I'm sure, is aware, I used to work in the IT telecom industry, and every every now and then, periodically, I get motivated to touch base with my former colleagues in arms, I guess you might call it, and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the times are tough uh, mantra, oh, yeah. it, it goes across the industries. I mean, it the, does. the strange thing is, you hear these rumors about, you know, things are getting better for technology in general and that, you know, huh. we should feel more comfortable about life. But but the reality is, you know, I've talked to four different CEOs the last three days, mm -hmm. and um, every single one of them says it's tight. You know, and, and these are... It is. It's you know, very tight. Yeah, these are... Yeah, they, you know, they, they don't want to break out of the norm and, and get into anything new. They, they want to keep hanging on to this, the technology that, they're, that they know, that they're familiar with, that their people, their 
you know, technical uh, personnel understand, and they're just afraid to take the chance. But, uh, you know, I've never seen a winner that didn't bet. You've got to take a chance and go with what you know. Uh, if ever you get patents, you know, Japanese patents, and then you get the contracts with the universities and you pick up these, uh, you know, designers from uh, the top aerospace companies. Well, you know, there's so much information there that it's, it's pointing that, yes, this is going to work, you know, that they should take the chance. I mean, if they don't, if the Japanese or the, the English or the Europeans or anybody takes over this, uh, this is America's chance to, you know, really take over the transportation industry, the computer industry, and that sort of thing. And if they don't, then somebody else will. Yeah, no, it's an excellent point. Well, you know, and and I think one of the things that we can do as a culture, as a community, is Mm -hmm. to help educate the business world about the risks that are involved, to be able to say to them, it's, you know, because I I think that that risk-averse mentality the not knowing if it's a good idea is what scares right. them out of funding it. So I think that's one of the things that our community can definitely work on is being able to say to them, you know, look, we have some expertise that we can provide in terms of analyzing yes. these ideas. Yes, because their people are stuck in the standard world of aerospace and, you know, your standard uh, uh, physics uh, and this and that. And, uh, you know, the the world of quantum physics is just too strange for them. They, they don't want to, you know, they just... They're, you know, they just don't want to, you know, realize that uh, this is uh, advancement in technology. You have to change with technology as it, you know, improves or, you know, uh, I guess, uh, you know, moves on and, you know, changes. If you don't change, then you're going to be lost, and that's what's happening. And this is why we need to have these lectures to get out there and welcome all of the physics students, uh, teachers, instructors, and, you know, uh, that understand this so that they can say, yes, we do. And this is what we did with Dr. Barrett. He understood exactly everything that, you know, Michael was talking about concerning physics and uh, myself with engineering and and, uh, just, uh, you know, once they, you know, realize that everything is based on facts and, uh, you know, it's uh, it's all mathematically been proven, and this you know we got patents, and we got the people ready to build it. Well, it's time to you know put down the money and start building prototypes. Sure, sure. Well, so Larry, once the public, yeah, I, I well, think, anyway, yeah, I think we're almost out of time for this evening. But yeah. I want to say thanks for joining us, and thanks for sharing oh, yeah. the latest on what Unitel's been up to, and look mm-hmm. forward to seeing more of your work in the future. Yes, uh, let's stay in touch, Tim, and uh, I'll let you know when uh, we're uh, going to start our lectures here, and uh, hopefully we can, uh, you know, uh, carry on from there. Thanks again. You betcha. Have a good evening.